Imagine stepping into your favorite show to come face to face with the characters. Instead of passively watching from the sofa, you could join the adventure, leading and taking charge of your own journey. This may be the future of entertainment made possible by virtual reality technology. Virtual reality, or VR, is a system that allows us to recreate much of the physical world using digital information. You may have only recently heard about VR, but the concept behind it has existed since the 1960s, when Ivan Sutherland, a computer scientist at the University of Utah, described VR as the entrance to the wonderland into which Alice walked. VR technology has changed dramatically since then. Today, most users enjoy VR with a headset, like the Oculus Quest 2, which is a wearable goggle with little screens over each of your eyes. Based on your body position and movements, the camera and computer inside the headset work together to rapidly update the pictures that you see in front of your eyes. It happens so fast that you actually feel present in this world. And using hand controllers or gloves or even your bare hands, you can touch and move objects that exist in this simulation. Headsets can also include spatial audio, which means that sound becomes louder as you move closer to its origin and softer as you move further away, just like it would in the physical world. Because users are surrounded by multiple layers of rich visceral details, they often experience high immersion and feel like they're there in the virtual world. And with the rise of social VR apps, VR is no longer a solitary experience. We can meet and engage with other users as avatars, and multiple groups of avatars can share the same social space. Think of a busy coffee shop. Large num numbers of people share the same space, and multiple conversations happen at the same time. Unlike video conferencing, where only one person can speak at any given time, we can freely have conversations with anyone we like in social VR without disrupting others. As a communication and media psychology scholar studying human behavior in immersive virtual spaces, I've spent over 15 years scientifically designing and testing how our experiences in VR can shape the way that we think, feel, and behave. When I first started my VR research in 2006, a single headset cost $50,000, limiting the accessibility of the technology to researchers at sophisticated laboratories. Today, any of us can walk into a retail store like Target or Best Buy, purchase a headset for $300 or less, and find ourselves in a virtual world in just a few minutes. VR offers so much more than just games. It has the potential to be one of the most powerful tools of communication we have. And when powerful tools of communication move from a technology for a select few to a technology for the general public, they can dramatically transform how we connect, interact, and communicate with each other. With an estimated 30 million users with headsets at home, VR is not a thing of the future. It is the present. But integrating VR into our daily lives requires a transformative shift in our ways of thinking. Now, we must reimagine a digital space where our thoughts are no longer shared through text, pictures, and videos alone, but also through postures, body movements, and even interpersonal distance. I'm the director of the Games and Virtual Environments Lab at the University of Georgia. And the research from our lab consistently demonstrates that we can leverage the powers of immersive VR to help people live happier, healthier, and better informed lives. But we've also found critical problems with VR that we should be aware of and examine how we can proactively address them. The first thing that we need to consider when thinking about integrating VR into our everyday lives 
is what daily VR use might look like. Popular press is rife with debates and discussions about the metaverse, a developing concept of multiple immersive virtual worlds all interconnected with each other. Some critics are concerned that the metaverse will be so perfect and enticing that people won't want to spend time in the physical world. Parents are already seeing this as they struggle to adapt to the ever-changing rules of screen time. If you've ever tried to get a 10-year-old to put down a tablet, you know what I mean. But screen time is not a one-size-fits-all term. The content and activity that's happening through the screen can be much more important than the exposure to the screen itself. Think of a student using a computer to take online classes. Most of us wouldn't categorize the screen time spent learning the same way that we would categorize screen time spent playing video games. And the ways that VR helps us overcome constraints of the physical world may outweigh the negative side effects of screen time. We already use phones and email to stay in touch with family and friends who live far away from us. For example, most of my family lives in South Korea, and I usually get to see them for a couple months in the summer. And during the other 10 months of the year, we spend hours connecting with each other through video chat, sharing our achievements, struggles, happy moments, and sad ones. However, Communication science tells us that the quality of communication can be more important than the quantity. Often, the best interactions with friends and family involve sharing experiences together, doing things, rather than just talking about them. So using VR to connect with my loved ones in Korea and share experiences with them would be qualitatively different from chatting on Zoom. We wouldn't just see each other, we would be there, together. And if I spend several hours of high-quality time connecting with my family and friends in VR, should we be concerned that this screen time is somehow harming me? If my child can visit his grandparents in an immersive experience, should I, as a parent, consider the screen time that I need to limit? And given the work, play, and socialization that's already taking place online, is the absolute amount of minutes or hours that someone spends in the metaverse really a cause for concern? The next question we should explore on daily VR use is the dramatic change to our workplaces and work cultures. Many of us have experienced firsthand how technology can facilitate meetings and communication in the workplace especially when physical travel is impossible. And VR may bring even a greater flexibility because we would no longer be tied to the physical boundaries of the workspace. We'd be able to effectively work anywhere we're physically located, at home or elsewhere. These virtual offices could help us reduce business travel, cutting down our commutes, carbon footprints, and stress levels. People who can't travel for a variety of physical, mental, or financial reasons could stay in the workforce. We wouldn't be using VR constantly throughout our working day. We'd likely only rely on it when we need to do a task together rather than just talk or share information. But this also means that we're adding yet another te technology to our lives. The relentless push for productivity wherein employees can work anytime, anywhere, may also mean that we never quite get away from work. This can lead to burnout and, ironically, less productivity. We must create policies that empower us to draw firm boundaries and dis completely disengage from work and from other workers when the workday has ended. Finally, we must also establish a safety net to ensure that VR experiences don't intentionally or unintentionally harm users. Studies conducted in my lab demonstrate that the concrete experiences in VR are not just fun and engaging, 
but can also leave lasting imprints in people's minds and continue to influence their thoughts and behaviors, even out in the physical world. VR allows us to experience events with visceral details of not just what happened, but also where, when, and how. But despite the realism of these details, VR also allows users to transform the traditional rules of social interactions, which can be difficult to grasp for more vulnerable and inexperienced users, like children. When my son was eight, he was targeted by a scammer in Roblox, a video game where millions of players create 3D worlds to socialize and play together. My son created his own virtual world in the game, purchasing items from his allowance. One afternoon, a avatar who introduced himself as a fellow eight-year-old talked my son into giving complete access to everything in his Roblox world, then ran away with all the items. That was upsetting at the time, but my son moved on with life and rebuilt his virtual world, purchasing some of the items again. One week later, a different-looking avatar claimed that he was the older brother of that same eight-year-old avatar and wanted to make things right. So could he please release the administrative access again? <laughs> and surprise, that avatar also ran away with all of my son's items. <laughs> my son lost about $20 to the scammer but learned a valuable lesson in how the virtual world works that he'll never forget. I was stunned that the scam wasn't more obvious to my son, a bright eight-year-old who constantly receives media literacy lessons from me and interacts <laughs> in a carefully monitored media environment at home. But it was an important lesson for both of us that successfully navigating the virtual worlds is going to require a combination of preparation, vigilance, and trial and error. But this doesn't mean that we should prevent children from using VR completely. It's just like sending kids to the playground in the physical world. We have to teach them the skill sets that they need to survive and to minimize harm, but we can't be there all the time to protect them. Just like we teach our kids about stranger danger for real-world encounters, we have to be vigilant in the, in the virtual worlds as well. At the same time, kids need space to learn and grow on their own. It's a difficult balancing act, and so we should be prepared to discuss clear action plans for potential interactions in this virtual world. And kids have to understand that the avatars they meet and see may be far from who the people controlling them really are. We have to teach our kids that personal information should never be shared, and when in doubt, always ask adults for guidance. But like all of us, kids will learn, grow, and mature through the trial and error they experience in the virtual world. VR is one of the most exciting and engaging forms of entertainment but it's so much more than games or kids play. It opens the door to experiences that transcend physical time and space. We can share experiences, build rituals, and create memories with tangible interactions. All the advantages that VR brings to the table are available to us right now in our homes, schools, and workspaces. And big tech companies are gearing up to pour astronomical amounts of money into creating the infrastructures that will allow us to integrate VR into our everyday lives. Regardless of whether or what the metaverse becomes, we're now standing at the cusp of ubiquitous use of VR, a world where every one of us owns a piece of immersive technology. VR will continue to change the way that we connect and interact, similar to how the internet, mobile phones, and social media have transformed communication. 
Over the years, we learned to use these technologies and discover the risks and benefits along the way. This is our window of opportunity to learn to use VR to our benefit and minimize its risks. Embrace this new adventure and explore the wonderland into which Alice walked. Only then will we be empowered to make better and more informed choices about how VR is integrated into our lives. And who knows, you might even meet Alice herself in this wonderland. Thank you.